I'm Patrick Pacheco. Coming up on Theater All the Moving Parts, a conversation with Eva Price, who is one of Broadway's most bold and dynamic young producers. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Theater All the Moving Parts. I'm your host, Patrick Pacheco, directing the spotlight to those who help create the worlds of wonder we call the theater. Today's guest is Eva Price, a three-time Tony Award winner who has produced some of Broadway's most provocative fare, including Jagged Little Pill, Tina, and the revivals of Oklahoma and Angels in America. Welcome, Eva, to Theater All the Moving Parts, and congratulations on more than a decade of remarkable Thank success. You. Thank you, Patrick. A friend of yours once called what you do an emotional entrepreneur. <laughs> How do you cope to that? <laughs> cop to that, I should say, not cope. How do you cop to that? It takes both <laughs> coping and copping to be an emotional entrepreneur and a producer. Theater is a cathartic, emotional ride and the stories that we tell in the theater must be that. So if you're not an emotional creature in both the work you pick and the way you produce it, I don't know how you produce theater. I'd say do an another medium, produce different kinds of stories. But as the core of the stories we tell being something that emotionally grabs the audience, you have to be, you have to have emotions in the job title. And, an entrepreneur is what we do. We invent things from scratch. We, we're, every Broadway show is a startup, essentially. So it takes a big entrepreneurial spirit to get the thing going, and I love that. Do you pick your projects from here or from here? Um, it's sort of a three-prong feeling yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. that begins here, mm -hmm. punches me here, and then reflects here. Uh -huh. In that order. In that order, yeah, because I need to feel something to connect to it. My gut needs to tell me this is something worth doing, right? Something worth spending hours and years and your lifeblood on. And then I need to rely on my brain to say, hmm. this is a good idea. This is not a good idea. <laughs> this is how you would do it. This is how you shouldn't do it. That's a very intellectual response. Uh -huh. So I, I'd say it's equal parts all three, but in that order. Yeah. You started at the age of 26 after a stint at ABC News. Yeah. What drew you from you know, network television to theater producing? Well, what would draw you from network television to theater <laughs> producing? I think an awful lot. <laughs> I had started off my career in politics and then covering politics for ABC News. And it was just after the 2004 election. We're you know, now deep in 2005. The big stories of that moment were missing girls, hurricanes. And th this was before hurricanes were actually political. The Pope had just died, which mm -hmm. was a big story. But there was not a lot of creativity and, frankly, new exciting stories on the horizon that sort of drove me in a passionate way, the way politics drove me in a passionate way. So I looked around at what would be my future if I stayed, and I just couldn't picture it anymore. So I had some friends living and working in New York City in the art scene and in the theater scene, and they offered me an opportunity to produce something with them, not knowing what producing theater even meant. It felt like an easy jump. It sounds... Uh like at least it was always on a slow boil since the time at the age of eight you saw South Pacific in New Hampshire Community Theater. That's right. <laughs> so there was always that in the back of your mind. Well, I was listening to soundtracks like other kids were listening to the Backstreet Boys. Uh -huh. I mean, it was every chance I had, there was another Broadway cast recording on my record player or on my recorder in my parents' tape deck. So I lived a, I don't want to say an alternate life, but like I lived a version of my life 
inside a musical. You know, I remember when I saw The Jersey Chaperone, 2008 uh-huh. maybe, I thought, oh my God, I'm that guy. <laughs> <laughs> and people come out of your refrigerator and Close start dancing in your living room. Close to it. <laughs> Among raising money, obviously, tapping into the creative team, getting rights, what do you suppose is the most important part of your job, the most significant part of your job? I think it's team leadership. Uh. I think keeping your team motivated, enthusiastic, happy, Uh committed, loyal, driven, and all within the same goal. And I know that sounds fishy because everyone must have the same goal, which is to open and be successful, but it's actually more nuanced than that. It's more complicated than that. I think the goals of a show are strategically focused and have to be strategically aligned. And I think it's more than we're going to make money or we're going to recoup or we're going to win an award. It is a 360 degree overarching umbrella plan and narrative and strategy that the producer has to hone in on, focus on and focus their team on. And so it's, it's a combination of like psychologist, coach, superintendent, (laughs) Mother, (laughs) it's a lot, it's a lot of those things. One of the things that you mentioned uh, before, and that is that a producer, especially today, must be aware of the world outside the bubble of Broadway. You gotta know what's going on in society politically, socially, and everything else. And it seems to me that Jagged Little Pill is a good case in point. Yeah, it is. And it's really interesting, right? Because it's based on an album from 25 years ago. From 1995. Right? The time was very different, yet it wasn't. The world was very different, yet maybe it wasn't. And the fact that we'd been working on this musical for many years, certainly even before the Trump administration took fold, but that the themes that were in Alanis's album almost 25 years ago, and the themes that we wanted the show to be about and to focus on, and the themes that now exist in the show that the creative team came up on their own with. Diablo Cody as the book writer. Exactly. Diane Paulus as the director. That's right, um, that's right. Shaped this thing about a dysfunctional family that's in right. Connecticut. That's right. Which is an extraordinary. First of all, how did you get Alanis Morissette to give you the rights? You mentioned politics earlier, and you're very persuasive, so I hear. Uh, uh, that's, that's very kind, and I am, and I am. But credit, <laughs> credit goes where credit is due to my brilliant partner, uh, both my partners on the project, Vivek Tiwari and Arvind David, who, as I like to say, Arvind had the idea in his shower one day that it would make a great musical. He had come from the film and television world, and Vivek, who'd come from the music world, actually was three degrees away from Alanis and did the heavy lifting of taking her to lunch and having that conversation. And I think she recognized the passion and the inspiration that some young producers could have. And I, right place, right time with my friendship and experience um, with Vivek, Uh, that brought me to the table. And she did not want a jukebox musical. She did not want a musical like Beautiful. She wanted a a story. Uh, And there was a story inherent, presumably. Who brought in uh, Diablo Cody? Who brought in Diane Paulus? How did the team come together? Sure. So, I mean, I feel like Mm. Diane is sort of an obvious choice if you think Mm -hmm. about her work and who she is and what she's done and the fact that she's the artistic director of the ART. It's very helpful and very smart to have of a developing theater as part of your process. And uh, my partner Vivek had actually gone to high school with Diane's husband, so knew, knew Diane for many years. I've known Diane for many years, and the community knows and loves Diane, so that felt fairly obvious. Diablo Cody had been a dream person to write a urgent, funny, surprising, contemporary book. For Oscar musical. winner for Juno, obviously. And was she looking for a theatrical project? No, no. no? You know, she had, she had had great success pr- at a pretty young age with Juno. She'd had sort of uh, um, excellent other film credits with the young adult and most recently Tully, right? Which mm-hmm. always deals with serious issues, but in a, I think, very hip, 
and very clever and very surprising acerbic way. So, you know, she was able to tell story with great depth and emotion, but also with great wit and levity. Uh -huh. And that was sort of like a key thing to what we wanted to do. And Jagged Little Pill is no slam dunk. Certainly the dark and fascinating revival of Oklahoma's no slam dunk. Peter and the Starcaster was no slam dunk. Hal Prince once said, as a producer, you have to give the audience something they didn't know they wanted to see. Yeah. Is that a credo by which you live? Absolutely, absolutely. There's this idea that someone once said to me about the purple elephant in the room, hmm. which if you think <laughs> about it, makes a lot of sense, right? An elephant in the room is the thing that everyone knows is there, but you don't want to talk about or deal with. The purple elephant is the idea that that elephant is both surprising, <laughs> you either don't see it at all or you really see it and it's like nothing you've ever seen before. When I think about my projects and I think about all the aspects of them that are both purple and elephant-like, I guess, <laughs> but frankly are just surprising and singular, then I think they are the things that I want to bring to Broadway. I, I'm just not interested in another living room comedy that we've seen a hundred times. I love to go to them, but I don't think I'm the one to produce them. I, I'm the one to produce the thing that is very hard to describe and create and believe. And how do you balance that, the purple elephants, with your fiscal responsibility to your investors? When you're out on a limb or doing something risky, how do you explain it to them? Well, I think if we look back on history, the things that actually work commercially and on mm -hmm. Broadway are the things that are different and special, right? I'll take, for example, a mm -hmm. show I had nothing to do with, but as soon as I heard about it, I knew it was gonna be a hit, and I think people actually, same, same judgment, same thing of like, why would that ever work on Broadway? And that's the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime. Mm -hmm. Why would that in America work? Well, it was so special and so singular and so unique, and it was a purple elephant. It just didn't exist before. And Fun Home, and Bands Visit. Why would that ever work exactly. on Broadway? Exactly, so I just, I believe that there is a lane for producers like me who are taking risk and, and changing the paradigm and making bold choices because I think in New York and it seems around the country and around the world, audiences are interested in that now. And is the way of doing business and the business can be stuck in amber is the way of doing business receptive to that lane, receptive to that line of thinking? Yeah, I think so. I think that they too are savvy and they too know that there is room for Frozen on Broadway. There is room for Aladdin on Broadway. And there's room for great giant movie adaptations on Broadway. But I think theater owners also believe and that the tastemakers and the critics and the press and all the people that need our support on to make Broadway shows successful believe that there is room for this other type of material. When you were moving uh, Oklahoma from St. Anne's to, um, to Circle in the Square, First you had to persuade Ted Chapin to let you do that. I did. And then you also had to persuade the theater owner to give it to you even though you had competition for that theater. You're persuasive, not <laughs> political. How did you manage that? How did you get it? How did you convince Ted? <laughs> and how did you get the theater? Well, you've talked to Ted, so, so you probably know how I convinced him. But um... He said that you were very persuasive. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I, I can be gently relentless. Just ask my siblings. I think you said you never relax. <laughs> I think it's very clear that that production of Oklahoma deserved to be seen by many, many more people than just the folks up at Bard College who saw it originally or saw our production at St. Anne's Warehouse. And I think the media helped us do that. I think the tastemakers of the Broadway industry helped us do that. But most importantly, Ted and the Rodgers and Hammerstein organization realized that and helped us do that. They knew that it was vital that another 75 years of life had to be breathed into this property. They knew that as the r &H catalog had to compete against all sorts of other musicals for the rest of its existence, right, that new ways 
of reimagining and seeing their catalog would be helpful to them. Mm -hmm. So how did I do it? I <laughs> You're a great networker. I didn't stop. <laughs> you're very good. Nick Scandalia with the Netherlander said you're one of the best networkers <laughs> in the business. <laughs> <laughs> Getting back to the idea of teamwork that you mentioned yeah. earlier and corralling everyone um, to some extent. Paula Vogel once said to me, I know it's a good collaboration when you have really good fights. How do you negotiate, quote unquote, the fights among your creative team? Yeah, I live for friction. Uh -huh. Honestly, I think some of the best ideas and the best moves come from friction. If everyone is just agreeing with each other, it's not helpful, you know. I think that encouraging debate, keeping the table open for questions and disagreement, I think by sort of, you know, polling the audience if I need to take a, a note from who wants to be a millionaire <laughs> is a tool I like to do. I like to, to sit in a group and Perhaps I feel quite certain about a decision, but I want to ask what other people think, and I want them to feel empowered to say it should be something else. And I think I do that by creating a very safe, open, um, democratic place for discussion. And, and I do that with, with my team. You know, I ask questions. I don't give directives. I like to say that the mm -hmm. right note at the wrong time is the wrong note. So uh -huh. I would never say to a creative a thing that they're not ready to hear. I would rather ask a question that would lead them to perhaps get to the answer on their own because anything I will say or do won't help. And at some point, do you defer to your director? At some points. <laughs> Depends on which points you're referring to. <laughs> well, let's say that you're going back and forth and back and forth, and, and the only resolution is for you to step in and sort of defer to someone on yeah. the point. That's how I deliver the delineations with directors. Uh -huh. We're both in charge of visions. We're both in charge of how this show has to exist in the world. But anything within the, the theater doors at the end of the day is their domain. And anything outside the theater doors at the end of the day is mine. And so though I would love to collaborate and find consensus on everything in both our spaces, sometimes we're going to agree to disagree. and. I let them win if it's inside the theater doors, and unfortunately, they have to let me if it's out. What I find fascinating about the way that you are a producer is that you are there moment to moment in terms of realizing this vision that you share with your team, and at the same time, you're taking the long view, and I'm not sure that people have ever done that quite in the same way before. You're looking, and it may be because yeah. you came from a touring background, yeah. so you're looking at the whole picture. Can you talk a little bit about Oklahoma in terms of that? Because I don't think it will recoup uh, on Broadway. But you have in the back of your quiver the idea that you're going to get the money back to your investors. So when I looked at Oklahoma um, and I wanted to move it to Broadway and I knew revivals were risky and I knew that this revival specifically would be risky, <laughs> Very risky, that I needed to do something a little different. And because I had been working on getting the rights to Oklahoma for so long, I had been testing the waters for the road for that, this property. I'd been talking to presenters and figuring out its touring life and understanding how it would work across the country. So I always knew a tour was going to be a, a very real aspect to the show's future. So when I made the plan for the Broadway capitalization, I decided that we were going to capitalize both the Broadway show and the touring production in one. So investors were not diluted. So everyone had an opportunity to make a piece of what was the more guaranteed part of the pie, which is the tour than Broadway, and so that people could feel safe in their investment and in their belief in a project that had great risk. And I think we're going to get there, which is exciting. Do you think that the media, uh, the New York media, and perhaps other people in your profession have a condescending view to the rest of the country when it comes to touring, when it comes to your touring markets? Do you, Patrick Pacheco? I hope not. <laughs> I mean, I come from, I don't come from the heartland, but I hope not. Uh, you know. I think you don't, but I think your <laughs> colleagues do. You do? I do. I, th okay. I think, listen, I think my colleagues do. Uh -huh. I, think there's, I think there's a handful of people that think the only thing that matters 
for the American theater is what happens between the East River and the Hudson. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's true. I think there's a lot of great work even happening in Brooklyn, and I think there's a lot of great work that happens in other cities like Washington, D.C., or Chicago, or Los Angeles. Um, and I think the importance of theater across America is vital. It's vital for the future of the art form. It's vital for the future of America. I mean, I think people who go to theater and appreciate theater are more human. They're more caring. They're more mm -hmm. connected. More they're, open. They're more open. They're deeper, more layered people. They're deeper, more layered adults and therefore could be better fathers and mothers. Um, and teachers and professionals in their other industries. So we need to extend not only the great work that we're doing in New York, but we need to extend it across the country. People need to see our productions. What productions have you toured that perhaps people in our profession were surprised did well, that perhaps didn't think that they it would do well? I don't think ever, um, anyone thought that the one-man show that I produced called The Lion, Benjamin uh -huh. Flair's The Lion, did you know that show? Yeah, Would, yeah, loved it. Yeah, loved it. Beautiful. I think I saw it in MTC, was MTC, it? MTC, yeah. Loved it. I think no one expected it to exist outside the four weeks at Manhattan Theatre Club, never mind for 50-something weeks around the uh -huh. country, which is what we toured it for. It had heart. I think that's what... Got, got people. That's right. You know, there's always something about a father-son relationship or a parent-son relationship, parent-daughter right. relationship that obviously Jagged Little Pill comes into. Yeah. Um, in terms of giving advice to people that want to break in, and especially to a woman that may, a young woman who may want to yeah. break in, what's the most important piece of advice you can extend to them? Keep going. Keep asking. Keep calling. Lots of coffee dates. Keep coffee dating. <laughs> Keep a high tolerance for caffeine if you can. <laughs> Just don't stop. Just, there's so many doors closing all the time on us, men, women, anybody. It's especially easy to question your confidence and your self-esteem when that happens, especially when you get a show to happen but then it flops or you get so far with an artist and then they quit or you get so far with an investor and then they pull out. It's very, very easy mm -hmm. to say, forget it. Um, but don't, don't forget it. Keep doing it because it can happen. Hard work actually can pay off. Tenacity, tenacity, persistence. Yeah. Um, there is a push obviously for diversity and a well-deserved push for diversity for women, for people of color. How do you balance that push for diversity with simply getting the best person for the job? I think the best person for the job can exist in all shapes and sizes and colors and genders and representation. So I, I don't stop looking. I don't think it's accurate to say that the best for, person for the job, I've tried and I, found, and I couldn't find them in a, in a diverse or representative way, so I hired this person. Keep trying, mm -hmm. keep trying. I, I, I just believe that as long as we're searching and fighting and looking and we're open, we're open to talent that isn't obvious, but talent that is there within, that we can find all sorts of people to represent our both creative team and on stage team. And I've tried very hard to do that in, in every way. I think a person once said to me that if we're not explicitly included, we're implicitly excluded. That's a great, great line. And I thought that's the way perhaps to, to look at it. I, have, I, I was reading uh, an interview with Alanis Morissette, and she said that when she did Jagged Little Pill, she was profoundly lonely when she did the album. Yeah. But she continued to be profoundly lonely, and suddenly... Your team came along and created this production and it assuaged her loneliness. She found a family mm. somehow. Can you talk a little bit about that relationship with Elanis Morissette, yeah. the production, yeah. the way that somehow it meant so much to her? Well, I think the key was this creative team. You know, we talked about Diablo and we talked about Diane Paulus, but we also have the Tom most Kitt. genius. <laughs> music supervisor, orchestrator, and arranger, and sort of man of the theater, like man of the musical theater paradigm in Tom Kitt. And I think 
when you add that comfort and that level of talent to what, what you're well describing is loneliness and fear and uh, trepidation, that can sink away. Everyone on our team is extraordinarily kind and generous and no one is built on ego. No one is acting out of defensiveness. No one is anxious to the point of mean. And I think when that happens with a group of artists, you feel welcome, you feel like a family. You know, our choreographer, Sidi Larbi Cherkawi, it's his first Broadway musical as well, but you know, he's choreographer, Beyonce. Uh -huh. <laughs> he has an Olivier, I mean, he's not nobody, right? But you know, it was his first time too. So you had Diablo writing a book for the first time, you had Alanis, making a musical for the first time. You had Larby choreographing for the first time, but you also had Diane Paulus, who was a stalwart, and you had Tom Kitt, who was a stalwart. And, you know, it, it is easy to find comfort in a safe communal place. And that was what our creative team became. And frankly, it's what our producing team has done as well. I mean, you know, we're, we're up from very different walks of life. One of my partners is Malaysian. The other is his family's from Guyana. You know, I'm a gay Jewish woman. <laughs> like, we're, we're, all, we're of all shapes and sizes. And we have found our uniqueness to actually be our strength. Great. Well, I hope that Rainbow Coalition ends with a <laughs> big pot of gold at the end. We all do. At the end of it. Thank you so much. It was just a delight to speak with you, Eva. Thank you, Patrick. I always enjoy it. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back next month with another look at the expert and singular artist who live and work only to astonish us. I'm Patrick Pacheco.